se ve nada absolutamente nada hay retos que parecen imposibles desafíos que van contra la lógica sueños que exigen demasiado sacrificio y preparación aunque la razón te invite a abandonarlos porque no se trata simplemente de llegar a la meta sino de hacerlo como nadie lo hizo hasta el momento sin rivales, sin errores sin nadie con quien competir, tan solo tú, la infinita soledad y las ganas de luchar por algo en lo que realmente crees. Hubo quien dijo que era un loco. Otros pensaron que no lo lograría. Y muchos que no apostaron nada por mí. No permitas que te digan que es imposible si de verdad crees en ello. Lars Ebbesen is uh, is a guy who has work, been working with expeditions for 30 years, 35 years, and uh, been uh, exploring on all the seven continents. Actually, eight continents if you take the polar sea as the eighth continent. So I've been around many places and uh, and uh, had fantastic experiences. And uh, now I more and more are. Uh, uh, being back up to help and support people who want to do extreme things. Uh, which are the expedition, the more important expeditions that you have done? The most important expedition I have done uh, is is the South Pole. You know, it is the biggest and most challenging goal you can set yourself. Maybe together with the North Pole, it's very few reach it. It's very expensive. It's so remote that it is nearly impossible to make it work. And uh, when you reach the South Pole, uh, it's uh, it's something that even your mind cannot understand. <laughs> yes, I know that experience. Uh, what is you know? What I find more uh, most attractive with, with the polar expeditions is that it is uh, a place where, uh, first of all, you cannot see your goal, where you're going. Uh, you just have a goal in your head. And that means that the mental uh, challenge is much bigger than, for example, a mountain where you see that I'm going there and every day you can see where you're going. And uh, if there is a problem, you can turn around and go down. Uh, while on a polar expedition, if you start, there is no way back. You know, you just have to be perfect all the way. And uh, you have to be mentally very strong because, you know, even though you can't see it, it's the same. You can just go over and over and have ch new challenges the whole way. Uh, and, uh, and you have to just be so strong in your head uh, and keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And uh, there are very many who try and they don't have that uh, enormous ability to, uh, to push constantly, even though uh, you find no inspiration either than in your head. So that's what I like about it. At the same time, it's 
some of the areas where you totally get away from people. You know, you don't see any people, no animals, no planes in the sky, nothing. It's you and and the area, and, uh, and I think that's uh, a fantastic experience, especially in today where you have people everywhere. I just start again, or? Yes, please. Uh, well, no. yep. What makes Antarctica stand out is that it is a continent. Uh, so it is a whole continent by itself, and it is the most remote place on Earth. It is the highest continent on Earth because the, everyone thinks it's flat, but it is 4,000 meters uh, high. Uh, it is the coldest place on Earth. It is the most wind-swept place on Earth, and there is absolutely no infrastructure at all. So it means that if you decide to go to Antarctica, you know, uh, there is an enormous system that has to be operated to do it. And, it's very, very few who are uh, able to who are able to go there and experience uh, this absolutely fantastic uh, place. And uh, yeah, together with you know all the phenomena, it's uh, it's uh, a huge challenge to go there because of the wind and the cold and the distances and, uh, and the challenge. So I think it's one of the ultimate challenges you can actually find. What is the, the more dangerous things in Antarctica? <coughs> the wind, the colds? When you are solo there, what is the most dangerous thing? Yeah, the most dangerous thing in Antarctica is, you know, uh, the most obvious question, uh, answer is, uh, is crevasses. And we all hate crevasses and we fear them intensely, but at the same time, uh, with a place that is so cold, it's very stable, and uh, if you do things correctly and have experience, uh, crevasses is not necessarily a big risk if you do everything right. So, uh, more to the point of what is dangerous is the wind. The wind is always the biggest enemy, because when you have minus 30, minus 35 uh, degrees and you have wind, the wind chill factor will very easily go up to minus 40, minus 50, minus 60, and maybe even minus 70. And when you have those temperatures and you just have to move, you have to work, you have to do it, you cannot make any, any mistakes. And the wind will mean that uh, you will get frostbites just in an instant. Uh, so that puts an enormous strain on your concentration and your professionalism and being able to always think ahead of yourself so that you must always think what will happen in 20 minutes, what will happen in 20 minutes and you must always change so all through the day you just go and you, you try to figure out how cold it is, how the wind will affect you and how you to, to beat it and uh, that's an enormous challenge and an enormous danger. How you have to dress in Antarctica? Excuse me? Uh, how you have to dress, how a polar explorer has to dress, which clothes, <coughs> which clothing has to have in Antarctica? How to dress in Antarctica? That's very interesting. Um, for a polar explorer, uh, it's a uh, it's hopeless uh, thing to do because uh, when you go there, you, you do an enormous amount of work pulling a sledge of 100 kilos, maybe more, and in snow that is very sandy, there's hardly no gliding, so it's extreme work that you are doing uh, down there. <clears throat> and doing that, that work, uh, you know, you will sweat and you will really, really work hard, and you can't allow yourself to sweat because if you sweat inside the jacket, it will turn into ice. So we have to dress as cold as you dare. So you try to put on as little as possible and you start working and you build up this comfortable heat that you can work in without sweating too much. And then you push a little bit harder and you have the brakes and you eat and drink a little bit quickly and you start again and you cold and you will really freeze for the first five minutes till you manage to build up heat again and then you have, are comfortable again so you have to dress as cold as you dare and it's very scary 
part of being in Antarctica where you always push the borders because the more you push it and the more you hit it, the less you sweat. And because Antarctica is much more a high altitude uh, expedition than people think, it's, it's like climbing in high, uh, a 4,000 4, meter peak in, in Himalaya. It's a lot about acclimatizing and drinking and breathing out the vapor and you have to drink and balance sweating. So it's, it's complicated. So you want a jacket and pants that are long and very good against wind. And on the inside you need uh, some, uh, some garments that will not have the sweat stay in the clothing because if the clothing gets wet and close to your body you will get even, maybe even frostbite but really chilled. So it's a very complicated thing to dress correctly and uh, there's no answer to it 100% because you need to know your body and you must have experience and those are without experience they will dress too warm and uh, they will go slow and uh, maybe not get there. Yeah, what is your mental setup when you are in a blizzard, when you are in a storm with wind uh, like uh, 60 kilometers per hour in Antarctica and you have, you have to set up the tent yourself, solo? <coughs> the problem with the tent in a storm is, uh, is uh, very interesting. Again, it is uh, uh, one of those things where you really need experience and you really need safety and of course the worst thing that can happen is for the tent to take off and a tent takes up a lot of wind and can very easily you know uh, dash off and go rolling out to the coast which is terrible uh, so the whole thing is to have very strict rules and even on nice days you follow the rules so that they are into your system 100 percent and uh, that is to you know hook yourself onto the tent, put it up with the wind in the correct sentence, do it quickly, and you must just have it in your blood because to put it up in really strong winds is is experience. You can do it, and when you do it solo, it's it's a lot of technique, and that is what is making probably the worst thing with a, with a solo expedition is all those things that is quite easy to do with several people and you have to do it yourself. It, it pushes the, the danger limits uh, a lot and it's something that on the polar expedition as a solo goer you will push borders gradually. So it's not like one you start with a set of uh, experience but you will change your approach, your experience and will push a little bit longer the whole way and you just hope that you don't go too far because that's a catastrophe. So it's, uh, it's interesting and, and the tent is of course uh, the most dangerous part uh, of that because you can't be too careful because when it's blowing really hard if it takes 30 minutes to put on the tent you might be so cold that you might not even make it so you need to be very quick very precise, very organized, and, uh, and just very, very good. Why you tell me something about the Norwegian way to do polar, uh, polar expeditions? <coughs> because, you know, everything started with uh, Nansen, Amundsen, and nowadays, uh, Borge, you, Bengt, uh, Christian, Eide. So, I mean, why you are so good in polar exploration? And why, for example, another nationalities, they don't have the experience, they don't do the, the things in the proper way. Is it your blood? Uh, what makes us good polar explorers in Norway? Uh, I would like to say it's in the blood, <laughs> but I don't think that's true. Uh, some people say that we're born with skis on, but if we were born with skis on, our mothers would look terrible. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I just think that we have, uh, we have gotten into a system where the polar community is working very well together. Uh, you know, uh, Amundsen taught us a lesson where preparation is everything, you know. 80% of the trip is before you leave, you know, mentally, 
preparation, all equipment, the food, the uh, routines, everything must be 100% in place before you go. Uh, you can't experiment when you get uh, go out there. So that is uh, what we're doing. We are fantastic at asking each other and helping each other. And that means that you don't need to invent the wheel every time you ask. And, and that's what, uh, what you did very well. You, you asked a lot of people and talked to a lot of people and you were able to, to find this, this way that suited you based on a lot of experiences and then you took that and you 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 found your way in in the whole thing and i think that's what norwegians have been doing uh, first of all we we try not to make it more complicated than it is uh, we try to make uh, to push borders all the time but we don't do too fancy things you know we uh, we build on experience and push the borders little by little then uh, at the same time, we are quite good skiers, and, and uh, even though you're going three, three and a half kilometers an hour, which is extremely slow, more like a snail, uh, technique is important when you are uh, taking one and a half, two million steps. You know, then energy comes into it. And if you have good techniques, you save energy. You have better balance. You save energy. You move your hips instead of just the legs, you save a lot of energy. You are able to glide the skis instead of just putting them down, saves enough a lot of energy. <clears throat> and all these things means that the more energy you have, the more precise you will be, the better you will do the day, the more kilometers you will do, the more chance of you reaching your goal. And, uh, and uh, putting all those things together has been uh, one of the strengths of, uh, of Norwegian explorers. Yeah, I was wondering about that, you know, I was thinking, did I do a mistake here now? No, no worries, no worries, it was great, but just next time, imagine that yeah, you're not. Juan, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, now is a bit speaking about me, well, do you remember when I contacted, when I contacted with you the first time? I mean, and all our process and so on, yeah. What do you would know when I told you I want to cycle to the South Pole? I mean, because you were one, maybe the first person that you really believe in the idea to cycle in Antarctica. So tell me something about what do you, what did you think about the idea to cycle in Antarctica? Because it was. Uh, you know, many people was thinking about cycling in Antarctica for so long time ago, so... Yes, well, first time Juan asked me about bicycling to Antarctica, I just thought, oh God, another crazy guy, a lunatic. Uh, and, uh, but I, I really like challenges, I love new challenges. And, uh, you know, the more I spoke to Juan, the, the, the more serious uh, I found that it was, and if you are really serious about it, then you're coming into this, okay, from just a crazy idea, it becomes something that is an interesting idea, and that's a very interesting process and, and very, very important. And, uh, and the more we started to talk about it, uh, the more I thought that this is a guy who, who could be able to do it. And, uh, Antarctica is a place where, depending on the season a little bit, uh, it should be possible to bicycle at least quite quite a bit down there because uh, it's very windy and uh, if the uh, if you don't have too much uh, snow, it should be quite hard surface and that's a good start for for bicycling. Uh, so we started there and, and we developed uh, a course towards, uh, towards trying out on this wild, uh, wild idea. And what I really liked was that, that uh, Juan wanted to do it uh, unsupported and unassisted uh, and, and on his own. And I think that is, uh, that is a very interesting challenge because of course you can bicycle to uh, anywhere in the world, even 
more or less Everest too. You know, if you just bicycle two meters and then start again and start again, and you have someone else carrying your food and all these things, everything is possible. But he wanted to do a real polar expedition. He wanted to do it in the traditional way. He wanted to set himself the same rules as Amundsen and the big heroes. And, and he wanted to make the challenge the ultimate challenge. Uh, which is having no help from, from the outside, carrying everything with him. And, uh, and that, uh, that really attracted me in, in this thing and uh, it became a wonderful project. Really nice. It took two years and a half. Yes, the process for uh, for Juan's trip was uh, was wonderful, and it was the way I like it because a lot of people uh, these days, you know, they they seek help and they get to the targets with a lot of aid and very fast, and maybe without really taking their time to learn learn every, everything. Uh, that is whether you go to Everest or you go to Antarctica. You can do it with experienced people uh, very fast. But, uh, but we put in this plan where we're building up towards uh, being able to do it uh, based on, uh, on Juan's own experience and own knowledge and things. So it was a process of coming to Norway a few times and going to Finnmark and going up there on skis and know how to do everything on himself. Cross Greenland uh, even with a bike there and bicycle a little bit and go and go in the fall which is the worst time to go where the weather is really bad and it's really hard and you don't know and you see the crevasses and you really learn about the crevasses and the problems and what is underneath the snow and you know really build up everything and, and uh, taking that time and do that means that you you become much more complete as a polar explorer and, and then you're able to do it so and, and by yourself in in the most honorable way <laughs> and, uh, and that happened and um, that makes me extremely happy and it's a wonderful project to be able to follow Challenging, like, oh my god, uh, Juan even is not able to stay on the ski. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's much easier when you get a sledge behind you. Yes. Um, what do you think about my expedition in Antarctica? I mean, I call at you every five days or one week and I inform at you, and it was great at the end to. South Pole. So, yeah, you told me before something about expedition, but I need that. I need your opinion again. What I think about Juan's expedition to the South Pole, it uh, it was amazing. It was absolutely fantastic, and uh, uh, I was lucky to have him call me. Uh, quite often in the trip so I could kind of follow the progress and, uh, and see how it was and you know, one thing is that it wasn't an easy, uh, easy year because we had a lot of more snowfall and much softer conditions that is, is usual uh, and due to that I was very interested to see how his head was coping with it, uh, not being able to cycle as much as he had hoped to. But you know, he, he stayed there uh, all the time on, on the ball and he kept pushing, pushing, pushing and was not willing to, to uh, being stopped by the snow and stopped by anything. And even though when food was uh, uh, running out at the end, there was just no way he was going to not get to the South Pole. And I think that makes, uh, makes it very different from most others that you, you you just do it and that's how the old explorers had to do it you know they couldn't 
call for help or a flight or anything like that. They just had to reach their goals. Amundsen reached his goal, Scott did not reach his goal and, uh, and died. And yeah, Juan wouldn't have died, but you know, that you're even willing to push it so far uh, and reach it means that uh, you have uh, done a lot of good mental preparation. And, uh, and that is uh, what makes uh, some polar explorers stand out among all the others, you know, when you have that little extra. Borga has that little extra and he showed again and again, you know, that he's able not to be uh, freaked out, not to lose concentration, just being absolutely on the ball all the time. And people think that, oh, you're just walking and it must be so nice, but you know, it's concentration and it's, it's uh, a mental process that is uh, impossible for people to understand. And, and that's what he did superbly. And, uh, and, uh, and that's why he succeeded uh, against uh, what turned out to be against all odds. So I'm very happy with the way it turned out. Hi Borge, thank you for coming. Yeah, uh, as a starter, one difficult question. Who is Borge Ausland? <coughs> Berge Ausland, he is a polar explorer from Norway, uh, now turned 52 wait, years old. Wait, wait please. Hmm. Nobody, <laughs> nobody will see it. Okay, Borge, hmm. yeah, we'll repeat again. Yeah. Who is Borge Ausland? Borge Ausland is a polar explorer from Norway. Uh, he uh, has been doing expeditions uh, in the Arctic for uh, uh, sh uh, almost 30 years, 28 uh, years, Ant Arctic and Antarctica. He's 52 years old and he's still in good shape. One more time or? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, one more time. Borga Oslan is a polar explorer from Norway. Uh, he's 52 years old and uh, lives in Oslo. Okay, uh, which are your most important expeditions that you have done? The most important expeditions I've done, um, well, if I should select uh, the few, it's uh, the first unsupported expedition to the North Pole by ski in 1990. First solo uh, and unsupported expedition to the North Pole in '94, and then the solo crossing of uh, the Arctic and Antarctica in '97 uh, and 2001, and um, the winter trip to the North Pole in 2006, and the sail through the Northeast Northwest Passage 2010, and a few more. But I think that those are the most important. There will always be some noise. Yeah. yeah. How is the noise? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They are saying that it's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is the feeling that is more attractive for you in the polar exploration? Why do you do usually solo your polar exploration? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, what is the most attractive thing for you to mm. the polar exploration? The most attractive things to me in the polar um, uh, exploration, I think it's the nature and uh, that it's so untouched by man. Uh, you are, uh, the nature uh, decides, you're just a guest there and you have, to, you have to adapt, you have to be clever and you have to be good at preparation. And when you do an unsupported expedition, there is no one to help you. You have to solve all the problems yourself. It's your own strength and ability to, to move from A to B that uh, will uh, determine if you make it or not. So, so for me, number one is nature. And it's also uh, mentally, it's, uh, it's like being on a different planet. It's like being uh, on 
day one on earth so it's a great also uh, mental experience in, in one way it's a kind of meditation i think especially when you do solo expeditions because you have a much deeper dialogue with yourself and also the nature especially in such a strong place with no one else to uh, um, to lean on yes what is the difference when you go with a group especially a strong group and when you go solo to Antarctica to the North Pole it's a different, it's a different way isn't it? yeah it's it, it it's a, it's a different way to do solo expeditions compared to doing exp expeditions with, with others. And well, one difference is that when you are with other people, you can always share the experience and you have much more fun. <laughs> so that's uh, a good part of it. But uh, uh, on, on the difficult side of it, um, you are much more exposed when you are by yourself when it comes to safety <clears throat> but also when it comes to the mental part because you have to be your own psychiatrist in a way uh, uh, there is no one to help you no one to drag you up from the basement if you have a mental breakdown one day you have to to find your own motivation every day uh, on, the, on the trip uh, but at the same time that feeling of being completely alone in such a strong and uh, desolated place is also the best part of the whole expedition because it's uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, just to be in that nature um, with with no one else to re to rely on it's a great feeling so in, in one way it's a trip with other people is going from a to b it's a very physical trip, but going uh, uh, this trip solo is a much more mental expedition and um, it's a great challenge. Yes, uh, tell me something about Antarctica. Mm. Why, uh, what is the big difference? Antarctica, Greenland, what is special in Antarctica? Okay. What is special in Antarctica is that it's, uh, it's so long away from everything. Um, uh, it's it's the loneliest, the coldest, uh, most wind-swept area in the whole world. So it's. Uh, and on the plateau in Antarctica, you're in an area where not even bacteria can live. So it's a very extreme place in, in many ways. Conditions are not too bad. I mean, it's uh, reasonably good skiing, but it's, it's a very lonely place in many ways. Yeah, what is the most dangerous thing, in, uh, the most dangerous, the most risky thing in Antarctica? With the colds, mm. the altitudes? In Antarctica, I think the most, uh, the biggest challenges are, uh, well, the low temperature in combination with the wind, uh, because there is no trees or stones to hide behind. Uh, you are totally exposed on this endless uh, plateau of uh, snow in maybe 3,000 meter altitude. So that's, uh, that is something you feel, so it's easy to get frostbites um, and also to have uh, crevasses um, which you don't see maybe because they are covered with snow and, um, and you are, maybe you are skiing in whiteout conditions so you don't really see the ground and you still have to be, you have to move because you have to reach your goal and when you are by yourself you cannot walk in a line with lots of rope and, and as you can in a group so it's uh, it's more dangerous to be solo on a trip like that in Antarctica. Yeah. Um, imagine one situation wind uh, in front of you a blizzard maybe 50 60 kilometers wind you are solo and you have to set up your tent. What do you think what is the mental setup and the technique because this is a tricky moment if the tent is flying away. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, to pick up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Det er ikke det beste stedet å filme. Yeah, to put up the tent in uh, blizzard conditions, that can be very, very tricky. And uh, if you lose your tent, then <laughs> you don't have anywhere to uh, hide, then uh, nowhere to get protection. So that's very serious. So, so uh, that is a big part of the preparation, always to, to know how to handle the tent and equipment. So, so I have all the... Um, tent poles ready inside the tent and I have a special method to, to put it up and also secure it with a um, five meter long rope to the sleds so if I lose it it will still be attached to my, my sled so you that's a part of the preparation and and that also defines in many ways if you're going to be successful or not the preparation because if you're good at that you can you can go into a dangerous situation you can be in a very dangerous place but still be able to do it because you are, have trained on it and you have been good with the preparation. Yes. Why, why the preparation is so important? Because people, they think, oh yeah, expedition, to just put foot on your sled, tent yeah. and go. Why is it so important? Yeah. Why the preparation mm. is so important? The preparation is something that many people uh, they uh, they take too lightly on I think uh, maybe because you can read everything in the books and you can copy the list of equipment and you can go but uh, to know what is working and what is not working you need to know that before you go so you need to have tested everything and you need to have experience so experience experience you get from preparation is uh, a really really uh, one of the biggest parts of uh, success. It doesn't matter if you're super strong, if you don't have uh, uh, the right uh, equipment with you or you don't know how to work with this equipment, you will probably not make it. And many people fail because of that. Yeah, yeah this is somehow the Norwegian way to do the expeditions. Everything started with uh, Nansen, Amundsen and now with you, with Klaus, Bank, and so on. So, Norwegian style is taking care about the little details, food mm. routine, so on. Could you explain a little bit somehow this Norwegian style and why you're the best? Well, I think it was Roll Amundsen who uh, defined uh, what level of preparation was needed to be successful on an expedition and uh, that was proven on his expedition to the South Pole in 1911 where he did more or less everything right even if he hadn't been to Antarctica before so and then that is, is all about having a, a humble attitude to try various things uh, and not give up before you know uh, what is the best and what is working and then you have to take it out and try it in real situations contacted with you and I told you, okay, I want to cycle to the South Pole, yeah, what do you think, <coughs> what, what you was thinking in that moment and why you really took me serious? Well, when Juan contacted me and he said he wanted to cycle to the South Pole, I thought that, mm, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> But then I also thought that um, this is uh, something totally new. And I like things that are new. And, and it's always these new things that move the world forward. And uh, so, it, so it's a new approach in polar expeditions, which I really like the, the concept of. But I also thought that, OK, Antarctica is a serious place. So maybe not, it's not the right, right place to start. That's what I thought in the first place. Yeah, and the, all the process, how I've been in Finnmark, uh, Vida, in uh, Lapland, in Greenland a couple of times. Uh, mm. It was a long process, more than 
two years and a half mm. on the way. So yeah, yes. Um, so 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 I thought okay. Juan is a strong guy, he knows how to bicycle, he has done a lot of bicycle trips before, but Antarctica is a different matter, is, uh, is serious. So I think, I thought that uh, it was best that he went uh, across Greenland before, uh, because Greenland is like a mini Antarctica. Um, the mistakes you do in Greenland, you can survive, but maybe not in Antarctica. So it's better for Juan to do his mistakes in Greenland instead of Antarctica. So that was my advice to Juan to go to, to, to Greenland first, to learn all the details, to learn what is needed to bring for the real expedition in Antarctica. And he's been two years of preparation, and that is necessary for doing a trip like that, which nobody has done before. Then you have to find all the answers for yourself. So I think this long uh, process of uh, preparation was really necessary for the success of this expedition. advices I think maybe I, I could contribute with uh, was to Juan on this expedition was, was of course based on my own experience and I know that if you want to do uh, a solo or, or a unsupported expedition especially if it's something new you have to be very focused on the details you have to try it out before you leave and everything has to be as light as possible super light uh, because speed is also safety if you're fast you will be able to uh, do the expedition in a short, shorter time and that means also that you are less exposed uh, and it also means that you don't have to carry that much so so uh, so to be to be fast uh, was uh, one of the advices and also to have focus on just the general protection of your body, like frostbites, things like that, to avoid injury because of serious frostbites uh, in Antarctica, that might be the end of the whole expedition. I am especially proud about the way that I have done it. My dream was trying to reach the South Pole and support it and at the end I have done it. Uh, so what is your opinion about my achievement? Well, well Juan's achievement uh, cycling uh, solo and unsupported to the uh, South Pole I think it uh, represents something very new and brave in the history of uh, Antarctica and I'm really really glad that he managed to plan it and train for it and succeed on this difficult expedition. Yeah, you were an inspiration for me, you know that I was thinking about all these amazing expeditions, going solo for the first time across Antarctica, going in winter time to the South Pole, oh my god, you were a real uh, inspiration for me and yeah, that's why I really wanted to do it and support it and uh, the last four days I was running out of food, so I was drinking chocolate with oil to yeah. get hydrated and survive with that. Yeah, you are the one that you are able to do these kind of things and you were an inspiration in those moments for me. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm also very glad that Juan managed to do it without support because it's a totally different expedition if you get an uh, airplane coming there every two weeks to give you food and uh, maybe a new sleeping bag or you know uh, support mentally as well so to do a trip like that uh, uh, supported and something totally new that's impressive
soy Juan Menéndez Granados, alguna gente me llama Juan Sin Miedo y soy deportista extremo, explorador y aventurero. Ser explorador y aventurero para mí significa querer superar tus límites, querer explorar lo desconocido, querer conocer los lugares más extremos, las culturas más remotas, las gentes más interesantes. Exploración en aventura no importa tanto el que hagas, sino el cómo lo hagas. Tratar de llegar al Polo Sur en bicicleta era algo que se llevaba mucho tiempo pensando, pero que nadie todavía lo había intentado eh, de una manera muy seria. No necesitaba mucha motivación porque, bueno, pues... Eh, cada, cada poro, cada célula de mi cuerpo quería llegar al Polo Sur. La gente se cree que para hacer estas expediciones tienes que estar como una cabra y no es así. Tienes que tener la cabeza muy bien amueblada. Sobre todo en los peores momentos, en los que estás solo. No tienes a nadie que te diga, venga, tranquilo. Métete en el saco, descansa, que yo me ocupo de derretir la nieve y mañana salimos de aquí, no te preocupes. Hubo una frase muy importante que nos dejó Mandela y que además fue una persona muy luchadora y que peleó por sus sueños y por los sueños de mucha gente. Y viene a propósito de lo de Juan sin miedo. Y es que el coraje no es ausencia de miedo, sino la superación sobre él. No es que no tenga miedo, sino que no tengo miedo a enfrentarme a mis miedos. Y yo creo que el miedo es algo innato en nuestras vidas. Tenemos miedo potencial a todo, pero tenemos que enfrentarnos a nuestros miedos y superarlos. <risa>